Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa sirli amli wa hlul uqtatan min lisani yafkahu kawli. Alhamdulillah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, the topic that I have been given to speak to you about is something that, alhamdulillah, I am very passionate about, and that is planning and evaluation. The first point that I want to highlight today, the importance of preparing. Alhamdulillah, we have so many examples from our deen of how important it is to prepare, how important it is to plan. Failing to plan is planning to fail, but we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners. But he has given us eyes and ears and hands and legs and a body to do things. So while he is in charge of Qadr and he is in charge of the outcome, the ultimate outcome for all of us, PSCC, we have an obligation to think ahead. The Quran refers to those who think, those who are intelligent as li ulil albab, those who think, those who plan, those who consider. So my first point in my talk today is about preparing. Preparing means you start with the end in mind. For your da'wah group, for the group that you represent, what is your objective? What is the reason for you to exist? What do you want to accomplish when all is said and done? You started a group, what is the purpose of that group and what is the specific end that you're looking to accomplish? Some people want to grow the ummah. You ask them, what, are, what is the reason for your group's existence? No, alhamdulillah, we're just here to do da'wah. What specific da'wah are you doing? Is it to the youth? Is it to women? Is it to a specific community? Is it to fundraise? Is it to grow your reach? Is it to expand your network? What is the fundamental reason for your existence? There is a concept of winning. If you want to win in life, you always start with the, with the end in mind. What is your objective? Before you even have a strategy, before you even have a plan, what is your end in mind? And this end cannot be a singular end. The end cannot be a singular end. Proper preparation means you always say, okay, as a da'wah group, our objective is one, two, three. They talk about having smart objectives. A smart objective is an objective that, you, that is specific, that is measurable, that is accurate, that is realistic, and is time bound. Yani, there has to be a time frame to this objective. So when we say what is your objective and how do you prepare, how do you start with the end in mind, you have to sit down as a group and say, our objective is by 2025 or by 2030 or by the end of 2023 or by the end of whatever, we want to achieve one, two, maximum three things. Many times we get ahead of ourselves because we have too many objectives. And too many objectives means that we end up being confused. What do you want to accomplish? No, I want to empower women. And then after empower women, well, I also think about the families. And then after the families, well, I also want to deal with the, with the youth. And then after the youth, no, I also want to build a masjid. It's too many things. So your objective has to be very, very clear. Usually for successful groups, you focus on one very clear objective. And that's why when you look at companies and businesses, they have what you call a vision and a mission. The vision is your objective. The mission is how you get there. So you have to have a vision as a group. What are we doing and where are we going? If, mashallah, you want to go, for example, to Mombasa and you start heading in the direction of Nakuru Naivasha, no matter how much money you have, how much strength you have as a group, it doesn't matter because you're going in the wrong direction. So ensuring that you have a very clear objective in mind and you say to yourselves, okay, if our da'wah group has a 10-year plan or a 15-year plan or a 30-year plan, at each stage, what is our plan? And then you break it down pole pole into years, months, weeks, days, and even hours. Because sana sana we find ourselves building the plane as it's flying. And then that's when we start planning ukombele. We start thinking about, okay, so maybe we should go to Mombasa. No, maybe we should go here. No, maybe we should go here. 
instead of sitting down from the beginning, before anything happens, before you start any job, what is your objective? And it has to be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. Put a time frame to it so that at least you can be disciplined, at least you can be honest with yourselves. So that's point number one, starting with the end in mind. What is your objective? What do you want to accomplish as a group? Can you look at yourselves and say, our group's mission, our group's vision is this, and our mission is this. If you're very clear on what your vision and your mission is, alhamdulillah, that's a good, that's a good place. And you see what that does is it prevents you from, from losing the plot. Because as the, as the game starts, many things start to happen and it's easy to be deviated by different people. Someone will come from Saudi and say, mashallah, I have a hundred thousand real or a hundred thousand dollars I want to give to a da'awa group. And then they tell you, we're giving you based on these terms and conditions. But because those terms and conditions are different from your objective, you now start thinking, yeah, actually we should take this money. But it's not, ta- it's not in line with your objective. It's not in line with your vision. So you start something nice and you start moving in this direction and then you're pulled in different places. So this allows you to be very, very clear from the beginning and you know that this is the direction that you want to take inshallah. Close to that, the second point that I want to emphasize is respect your milestones. Respect your milestones. So once you have a vision in place, you know that our group by 2025, we want to have maybe 2,000 people convert to Islam. That is our objective. That is our very, very clear objective as, as our group. We want to have 2,000 people by the end of 2025 convert to Islam. That's a very specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound goal. Now you say, how do we break down this 2,000 into milestones? When are we going to hit our first 100? When are we going to hit our first thousand? When are we going to hit our next 500? Because that way, and this is something that many people in business respect, you have to respect the numbers. Because you can be doing things like any, you're just doing it and then you say, how many of you guys, alhamdulillah, we've done uh, 200, alhamdulillah. Uh And then, well, inshallah, we'll see. My topic is on planning and evaluation. Yes, inshallah, we'll see. But, what are we seeing? What, is the, what are the targets that you're setting step by step on a milestone basis? Of course, we're talking about maybe, I'm just using that as an example, Lakini, there could be other things that your group wants to accomplish. Maybe you want to, to as, as you're doing da'awah, you also want to uh, maybe sink maybe 10 boreholes in a year. By what stage do you want the first five boreholes to be done? Because that at least allows you to have this thing called time in the back of your mind. Milestones are very, very important so that you break down your vision into achievable time periods. Respecting milestones is one of the best ways to successfully achieve any kind of objective. The third point that I would like to make in this discussion today, inshallah, is the importance of a team. The importance of a team. And you see a team People think of a team as just a group of people that have come together. Like now all of us, we can say we're in a team, mashallah. But the team has to have very specific roles and responsibilities. And those roles and responsibilities have to match the person. They have to match the person's personality. They have to match the person's skills. They have to match the person's characteristics. Even in a football team, you can't have 11 defenders or 11 strikers or 11 midfielders or 11 goalkeepers. You have to have very specific people doing very specific things. And your team, especially when it comes to activities that are people facing, which da'awah is, people facing teams need at least at a loose level a leader, And that leader, you can choose the way you appoint that leader and the best way to do that is to have rotational leadership. Because most groups fall and struggle because people fight for leadership. They're always trying to angle themselves to be mean your kiongozi, I'm the one who's in charge of this and I'm the one who's in charge of this. But from the beginning, if you know that you have an Amir 
from the get-go, someone who is specifically in charge, who has the final say. When I talk about leadership, I'm talking about the person who you nominate, who has the final say on whatever it is that you want to accomplish. But that does not mean that they have the final say on everything. Kwa sababu kila mtu akona talanta yake, kila mtu akona kipawa yake. Everyone has a specific gift and a skill that they bring to the table. So as you're putting the team together, it's very important that you look at everybody's strengths. Everybody has been gifted with something. There are some people who are very good at listening, mashallah. There are some people who are very good at taking notes. There are some people who are very good with details. There are some people who are very good with operations and planning. There are some people who, mashallah, they're very good on social media. There are some people who are very good dealing with older people. There are some people who are very good at dealing with children. There are some who are good at dealing with wamama and so on. So you need to find out specifically, okay, in our group, what strengths do we have? Before you even write down the positions, you ask everybody in the group, what strengths do you have? Where do you, where do you feel you can contribute the best? If you put people in the wrong positions, in the wrong roles, you will find people who are doing poor quality work. They will take a lot of time, they will be very, very slow, and they won't enjoy it. They won't enjoy doing what they're doing. And then utawalaumu, you will blame people, oh, wewe, unajua, wewe, tulikuambia ufanya hivi, na wewe ufanya, because you've put someone in the wrong position. You're, they're not playing their correct role. They're not playing according to their strengths. So it's very important, inshallah, in your groups, you very clearly underline what every person's strengths are. And then you leverage on those strengths, and you put them in positions where they will utilize their strengths, inshallah. So once you have their strengths locked in and you understand these are the strengths of the team that are involved, now you can start to say, okay, based on our group's vision and what we want to accomplish, our team can now have the following roles and responsibilities. Yani, not titles, roles and responsibilities, because now you have to find out what is each person going to do? What is each person going to contribute? Because once someone is, in, is doing exactly what they're good at, yani, wow, that is their natural strength. It becomes easy for someone to put their hand up and say, yes, hapo, in that role, I'm ready. Because it's easy to select people from a point of strength than from a point of nomination. Because most, hap most of the times in groups, what happens is, we say, okay, we need the following people to do this. I am, when I see you, you're going to be in charge of this. Salem, you, you're in charge of this. But I'm not good at that. I'm not... But I'll do it because you know what, it's da'wah and I have to do my, my duty to Allah. But I'm not good at it, so I'll struggle. It's like I'm writing with my other hand. I will struggle at this thing. So once people put up their hands and say, now in this role I can contribute this, now it becomes easy to hold that person accountable. Because now that person is doing what they are good at, what they are capable of, what they are strong at. And still on this team point, Still on this team point, and this is something that many of us forget, there has to be a way of incentivizing our team. Incentivizing our team. Incentive ni ile, si malipo, it's not about mshara or anything like that, or, or paying someone a salary. It's about how do we motivate the team members to keep coming and doing what they're doing. Of course, by the time you're in a da'awa group, in your heart you know that you, this is something that you want to do fisabilillahi and it's a calling, alhamdulillah. But still, there are times when people get tired. And I've seen it. I've been part of several Dawa groups, including this building that we're in. People get tired as people move along. But to incentivize means, how can we keep everybody motivated? How can we keep spirits up? And so you have to factor in a plan for team building inside your, your, your Dawa groups. You need to find a way where once in a while you have a budget for enjoy kidogo as a team. It's very important. It's very, very important that you keep people incentivized. You look for ways to get people that brotherhood or sisterhood and make people come together because sometimes it can be very tiring. The motivation, if you're calling me always, you're calling me, I see, I see, ah, ah, it's Abdul Razak's call. Okay, ah, he's calling me because he wants me to do something. He's calling me because he wants me to do something. Oh, it's Sister Fatima who's calling me. I know this is work. But if someone is calling you and they say, ah, I'm not calling you for work, I'm not calling you for anything, Nataka too, to enjoy, come to a certain place, we have a picnic, we have a lunch, we relax, we, we do this, we go somewhere. Yani, it's not related to anything specific. 
You know, those are some of the things that I talk about when I say incentive. We need to be able to incentivize our teams. Being able to have fun days where you go play football or you go relax somewhere or whatever it is that you guys come up with. You need to plan fun activities. They say, uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Mm. At least in the, in the process of all of this, let's remember to at least give ourselves time to enjoy ourselves so that we can have that incentive. Now, the next point, I think it's point number four. Point number four, inshallah. Once you've got your team in place and, and the roles and responsibilities are set. This team has to, be, has to have a very clear target market. A very clear target market, that's the next point. Point number four. Your group has to be speaking to a very specific group of people. Who are these people? What is the demographic? When we talk about demographic, we're talking about age, for example, region, language, profession, level of education, level of income. So that you understand that the people that we are speaking to are people of this level. Because that then allows you to moderate not just your language, but also penetrate the agenda in a clear, concise way. They say, <clears throat> I think it was, a, it was, a, it was a, 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 an author called Mark Twain. He said, if you speak to someone in a language they understand, they will be your friend. But if you speak to someone in their own language, they will become family. So the reason for making sure you have a clear target market is so that you can speak to people in their own language, in their own style, in the, own, in the way that they will accept this information. And also you will be able to understand where these people can be found. Because you, it, it will affect the next point which I want to come to, which is marketing. Understanding your target market will allow you to then say, you know what? Our target market can be found in these places. Yes, as we go out to do da'wah, as we're going out, we must be able to be specific, measurable, accurate, realistic, and time-bound. Part of that being specific is being clear on Nikinanani tunaenda kuwaongelesha. Who are these people that we are going to speak to? Can we profile them? Can we understand them at a deep level? What do they like? What don't they like? What are they comfortable with? What are they not comfortable with? There's that saying, unaweza pigia mbuzi guitar na uambia i dance. You can do everything that you're doing, but this person or this group will look at you like, what's the point? It's very important that you understand at a deep level the people that you want to speak to, which means, inshallah, you have to do some research. The group that we are targeting as a da'wah group, who are they? What are their likes? What are their dislikes? Can we come in from a point of their likes? Can we start with what they enjoy? So if we know that this group wanna enjoy vitukada nakada, then we have to put our dawah inside those things that they like. Because we can come above them and try and speak above them, but that means that we're talking down to them. Instead of coming from below, and we start with the things that they already enjoy. Zile vitwame zoer. And you might find some of these groups might be in places and spaces that, that are not particularly comfortable for you, which happens. I've seen videos where there are sheikhs who walk into nightclubs. There are sheikhs who are going into places that are very, very unsavory. But it's because they had already decided from the beginning that is our target market. So at Uko, it's not that we're going there to listen to music or to enjoy ourselves. We are there for a very specific purpose, but we have to meet people where they are. If you can write down on this specific point, meet people where they stand. Don't try and move them from somewhere. Don't try and move them from, oh, you're over here. Come, I want to tell you something over here. No. Go to the people, be with them, start with what they know. When your job is finished and the task is done, they will say, this was ours. Because if you try and remove people from where they are and you bring them, come to the masjid, come, come. It's, very, it's, a, it's a very nice place. And maybe this person, and you, you want to tell him about something that is foreign to him. And he knows what he knows where he is. 
You must be in a position to understand that you need to meet him where he is. Kama ni base utakuwa hapo kwa business eh. But of course, your level of iman is very important because it's easy to get sucked in. It's easy to be drawn in and now lose the, the, the focus and the perspective. Which to me is my fifth point. <clears throat> Do not lose sight of yourself. Do not lose sight of who you are. Because you will be in places and spaces that will take you, that will challenge you, that will push you, that will influence you in some way. Because part of, of being able to successfully influence people is to listen, to pay attention to them. Because if you're going to go with point number four, meeting people where they are, you're going to have to absorb a lot of information about them. You're going to have to take in a lot of, 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 of new stuff. You will discover new things that you have no business discovering, subhanAllah. But in that process, you must be very steadfast. And so it means that inside your da'awah group, the one role that is very, very, very significant in this is your, can I call it your Iman champion? Your Iman champion, someone who is there to constantly remind you about matters of Iman, because it is very easy to get sucked into some of these places and spaces where we forget ourselves. We forget that we are Muslims. We forget because we go into these places and we say, oh, but I'm here to do da'wah. And then kidogo, kidogo, you're there in the club. And then kidogo, imekwingia. You know, it's easy. We get influenced by what we see and what we hear. So making sure that there is an Iman champion amongst yourselves, someone who is there to constantly remind, not to force or to badger, like in Ile Makumbusho, to remind us that, you know what, we are here for a specific purpose. Do not forget yourself. Do not forget what has brought you here. And that, again, that can be something that can rotate, but it should never ever leave your sight. Because as we go out into the world, especially as individuals, it's easy to be drawn here and there. The minute you are with certain people, they will start to rub off on you. The minute you are in a certain group or in a certain space, you will say, ah, niko hapa tu kwa base, nafanya dawa. Ah, kesho yake, niko hapa tu kwa base, nafanya dawa. Kidogo, kidogo, the third day, uko hapo tu, ati, ii, ii, mirai naonja aje, wacha nionje tu. And then kidogo, and then, and then, and then. So having an Iman champion amongst yourselves and having that reminder for me is fundamental. It is so, so important. And maybe that can also be built into the, the team building so that you're always reminding each other that by the way, by the way, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. There's darsas continuously going on within your Dawah group to make sure that you do not lose sight of who you are. Point number six <clears throat> is about branding and marketing. Something that I thoroughly enjoy. Branding and marketing. Is there anybody here who has ever looked after cows, ngamia, ngombe, sheep? Just show of hands. Kila mtu ni bontown hapa. Hakuna mtu amewahi fuga wanyama. Kuna mtu amefuga wanyama? Che. Mai fuga. Kama nataka kujua hii hii nyama ni huyu mnyama ni Ametoka kwa boma yako na si, si, si mnyama wangu. How do I know? Ntajuaje? Uwi ni mnyama wako na si wangu? Kuna kitu uta, utaweka kwa sikio. Aha. Aha, alafu? Kuna, kuna design ingine? Kuna ile ku? Shingo. Shingo, aha. Watia nini kwa shingo? Kengele. Lakini ntajua ni kengele ya sheikh ama ni kengele ya mwenesi. Kwa ni kengele zina sound tofauti? Eh, unaweza kuchoma? Eh, that's the one I was looking for. Kuna ile ya kuchomelea, which is of course you have to do it in a very humane way. Usichomele, usifinye sana. It's just on the outside hapo kwa manyoya, si ndio? But in order for you to brand this animal, you have to take that hot chuma, si ndio? Wachukua hiyo chuma it's hot. You shape it in your name. So me my names are MM. So I would put MM on my on my chuma, niweke kwa moto, si ndio? Alafu I press it on the side of the mnyama, to know that this is mine. Branding is about the mark that you leave on people. The mark that you leave on people as a da'awah group, that is called branding. And if you're not hot, you will not leave a mark. So how do you become hot? How do you, how do you as a group become hot so that you can leave that mark? There are several steps I would like to share with you in terms of branding. 
Several steps I would like to share with you in terms of branding. The first step is awareness. Awareness. Who are you? Awareness activities are not complicated activities. Hakuna mambo mengi hapa, hii ni kelele. Nothing else. This is what we call hype. Awareness activities are centered around this is who we are. 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 You're not explaining anything. You're just letting people know this is who we are. And many people, I don't know, for some reason, we find, we feel like we're ashamed to tell our own story. But you, you, you have to remember that Bin Adam, we're creatures of habit. We're creatures of habit. So, to Nazoea, we get, we get used to things. So if I see something on day one, I see it on day two, I see it on day five, I see it on day 10, I see it on day 20, I see it on day 100, it sticks. It sticks. So you have to be in people's faces. There's no otherwise. The first step of any kind of branding activity is you must find a way to be seen and heard. Awareness. People need to see and hear you. And, I, and it doesn't mean you have to explain anything because these activities do not need you to explain anything. Jamia Mosque. Jamia Mosque. Jamia Mosque. Jamia Mosque. Jamia Mosque. By the 20th day, you keep hearing this. What is this Jamia Mosque? I need to find out what is happening here. Umeyona tu unayona. You pass there, you keep seeing it. Unafungua social media and yo inakuangalia. It's there, it's there. You're seeing it, you're seeing it, you're seeing it. Eventually, you will ask, what is this? Because sometimes we think that we want to start at the end of the branding exercise before getting people interested in what we are, we are doing. So awareness is the first step in branding. You have to get people to repeatedly see and hear your name or your logo. So whatever your name or your logo is as a group, find places where people can interact with it, especially in your communities, in the, in the target markets that you want. Kamani online, sour. Kamani in, in terms of however you want to do it. And these strategies are things that you can think about. How can we make our, our group name seen and heard? Not explaining. You don't have to explain anything. Just make sure that people see and hear, see and hear. There's this group, there's this group, there's this group, there's this group. Eventually, that curiosity will make people want to inquire, which is the second step of branding. You need to be in a position to now start explaining. The, the next position is understanding. If, if the first position of branding is awareness, the next position is understanding. Your team has to have people who can explain to people what this group does. How does this group do what it does? What is the objective of this group? What are you put here for? You're not trying to sell anything at this point. Nile tu maelezo. To make people understand. Because understanding is just explaining to people who you are and what you do and why you do what you do. But you cannot explain if you have no one to explain it to. That's why you have to first create awareness. The next stage after you've explained yourself is something called positive impression. At a sisi to kienda supermarket, we will look at the things on the shelf and we will ask ourselves, e toilet paper na e toilet paper ni gani mzuri? Hmm, I wonder. E sabuni na e sabuni ingine ni gani mzuri? Hmm, I wonder. Because we're trained, we're programmed like that, Bin Adam. Bin Adam is programmed to look at the things that they like. So positive impression activities have to do with creating that emotional connection with your community. Emotional connection means people will interact with people that they like. If I like you, I am more inclined to listen to you. Which means that as we go around doing our da'a, we need to be likable people. We need to be people who have tabassam. Positive impression means that you have to smile. You have to have a happy disposition. 
You can't go and do da'wah when you go umenuna, umeboeka, umejam. Huh? You have to smile. Have a happy disposition. And if that day, if the day that you're doing, you're engaged in any da'wah activities, you're not happy, can you mbani? Because, utachoma, you'll spoil the whole agenda of what you're trying to accomplish. Being happy is part of marketing. If you look at all marketing adverts, people are happy. Look at this iPhone, look at this drink, look at this thing. Wow, wow, happy. You have to be happy, people have to be drawn to you. We might downplay it, but it's a very psychological important aspect of marketing, being happy. Because being happy is infectious. It's infectious. The minute you smile at someone, they can't help but be like, okay, sour, what is it? Okay, okay, fine, sour. Right? If you just smile at someone, bus. Right? So as you're delivering your message, even as you're explaining whatever it is that you have to do, remember, a fundamental step in branding is positive impression. People have to like you. And being liked means that you have to be happy as you're doing your work. The next step in branding is trust. Trust. <clears throat> Ukisema utafanya kitu, fanya. If you say you, you're going to go somewhere and you're coming back, come back. If you say you're going to, you're going to uh, deliver something on a particular day, deliver it on that particular day. Because people, wanasema kusema na kutenda. Trust is, is now, this is, the, this is now the thing, the main thing. Because if you make a promise to, the, to someone, if you make a promise to the community and you do not fulfill that promise, of course, we know that one of the signs of a munafik is they do not fulfill their promises. But trust in branding means that branding is a promise. So if you go and make a promise to a, to a group of people or you tell them something, it is fundamental that you deliver on that promise. And one of the best ways to build trust, inshallah, is to under promise and over deliver. Under promise and over deliver. Sisi kwanza wa Kenya tukona tabiambaya. We over promise and under deliver. We know that something will only be ready on Thursday. But we tell you, ah, Tuesday, inshallah, hii Tuesday na kumalizia. No problem, don't worry. If you know that you will only be able to visit a particular place on Thursday, under promising and over delivering means you say, okay, maybe inshallah by the weekend. By the weekend, we will be there. But then what happens is, on Wednesday you say, Alhamdulillah, we've found an opening, I'm able to come tomorrow, not the weekend. This person will feel, wow, you've gone above and beyond your expectations. Don't overpromise and underdeliver. Try and underpromise and exceed their expectations and overdeliver, because trust is very, very important. We are tempted to make a lot of promises. We'll give you this and this and this and this and this. Tutarudi siku flani, siku flani, siku flani. And then when you don't come, oh, unajua kulikuwa kuna nyesha, or this, or whatever. But already, no matter what excuse you give, the trust has been broken. So trust is very important, guys. Allah, for the last one is loyalty. The last step is loyalty. And this is where your dawah group can grow. Because anybody who has interacted with your Dawah group before has the opportunity to join the Dawah group. Because that's, a, that's how new members join your group. You don't have to do a lot of recruiting. You don't need to go out and say, can you please join my group? Can you please join my group? If someone is aware of what you do, they understand what you do, they like you, they trust you, inshallah they'll join. But how do you keep hold of these people? How do you keep them engaged. Loyalty is something that takes time. Right? And this goes to my dear brothers and sisters, how are you communicating to each other? How do you talk to people within the group? How do you talk to each other? Do you talk to each other in a spirit of togetherness? Or do you talk to each other in a spirit of kutenganisha, to divide each other? Because loyalty is linked to something called unity. And many, many companies that do marketing, they understand that the best way to build our business is not to get new customers. It is to sell to existing customers.
customers. So even in your business, even in your da'wah group, instead of looking for new people, the same, same people who, who you've spoken to, you've taken them through this journey, those people become what you call your brand ambassadors. Your brand ambassadors, because how are to now they're in a position, although they're not part of the main group, they're not part of the main group. If you talk to them nicely, if you encourage them, if you remember specific things about them, if you get involved with them and their families and you get to know these people at a deeper level, it is very easy for them to go into the communities and spread the knowledge. So those steps, I'll just repeat them again. Awareness, understanding, positive impression, trust, and loyalty. All these activities are different. Awareness is just repeating, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here. Understanding means you explain what you do and how you do it. Positive impression is being happy as you're talking to people. Trust is saying what you will do and doing it. Kusema na kutenda. And finally, loyalty is making sure that you, ha you treat your people like brand ambassadors. Anybody that you've spoken to, you treat them like gold. Unawa, you, you do loyalty. They have something called loyalty programs. Even Safaricom has what you call bonga points. So you need to find a way of keeping these people loyal. What are some of the things that you can do to keep people engaged? And that's why team building activities are so, so important for our Dawa groups. Inside this agenda of marketing, I want to touch on something called social media. <clears throat> social media has become a game changer in, our, in the way we communicate. Mitandao na Mobile phones have changed how we do things. And you don't have to now find a big media house to spread your message. Just here where we are, there are, I don't know how many we are, but all of you can be journalists. Kila mtu hapa anaiza kwa journalist about this specific meeting that we're having today. If all of us today went on Twitter right now and we said, hashtag Dawa, movement Adams Arcade. If more than 50 of us do it, we will start trending on Twitter as an example. As an example, okay? Now, of course, I know that sometimes, and this is going to be in one of my points that I'm coming to, there's that fear that tutamulikwa, as, an in, as religious institutions, we will be spotlighted, that people will now start to say, okay, what is this group? What are they trying to accomplish? Nikinananiao, what are they planning? But you see, if you're very, very clear in your structure, it won't be a problem. So social media is a tool that you can use very effectively for your da'wah groups, okay? Point number seven, is it point number seven or number, number, number eight? Number? Number seven, huh? Number seven is put everything down on paper. Put everything down on paper. All right? Write down who you are, right from your constitution, your membership, the way you do things, everything that we've discussed, you need to be able to write it down. It has to be somewhere. Even people who are campaigning in politics have a manifesto. You have to have a document, something that explains who your group is, why you do what you do, your team structure, your objectives, your targets, your milestones, your, who, you, who your target market is, what you want to accomplish, and so on and so forth. Because putting everything down on paper allows you to have a reference point. The Prophet ﷺ said, I left you two things only. Only two things I left for you. And there were documents. The Quran and the Sunnah. That is the importance of documentation. Because you need a reference point for your group. And also it helps whenever something happens and one of your group members are accused of something, you can always say, you know what? This is our group. This is what we do. Here is the evidence. This is what we are. Because if it's not written down somewhere, it doesn't exist. Subhanallah. And that is how the world is today. Please ensure that you have something called a constitution because the structure of your, of your group has to be organized in a written 
format. You have to write down and document everything. Kunaflani, this is what they do. There's this position, this is what they do. There's this objective, this is what they do. By 2025, this is what we want to accomplish. This is how we're doing awareness. This is how we're doing understanding. This is how we're doing this. This is how we're doing that. It doesn't count if it's not written down. So please write down everything that your group does. And one of the roles, inshallah, in your group needs to be someone who will look after this document. Your DAWA group document. What, who, who, what is the structure? What is the, 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 the backbone and the reference of that document? Point number eight is evaluation and monitoring. Evaluation and monitoring can be every day if you want. It can be every week, it can be every month. But I've realized that the best way to do evaluation and monitoring is at least minimum once a month. Once a month, come together as a group and say, okay, what have we accomplished so far? And what do we want to accomplish? In the next month. So when you meet, let's say you set the meeting for your group or as fifth of every month, inshallah, or the first Friday of every month, the first Saturday of every month, whatever it is, and you meet, you're meeting specifically to ask yourselves, what have we, from what we decided the previous meeting, have we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish? And what do we want to accomplish this month based on our agenda? You're not meeting to now start saying, oh, Flani, you're going to be doing this, you're going to be doing this. No, because that has already happened. So we, we keep ourselves honest by making sure that our meetings are not to discuss general things. Our meetings are to discuss what we have done and what we're going to do. And once that is locked, the only thing we're discussing in the next meeting is did we do what we said we were going to do and are we going to do new things? Point number nine, is something very interesting and I wasn't going to frame it like this but this is the only way I know how to frame it is emotional intelligence emotional intelligence because what happens whenever we come together as a group there are different personalities and different people with different agendas their own style of thinking, their own way of talking, their own way of doing things. And so on and so forth. Not because people are being malicious, but because we're different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us all different. So emotional intelligence means instead of reacting to your team members, understand what is the reason for their emotion and how can you deal with the reason and not the person. Never make things personal between each other because that is a sure way of saying this person is like this. No, if someone want, has a difference of opinion with you, it's not about the person, it's about what is the reason behind that thing. Focus on the issue and not the person. Very important. Focus on the issue and not the person. A lot of groups live and die because we don't communicate properly with each other. We make it personal. We take issues personally. And we don't exercise emotional intelligence when we're dealing with each other. And emotional intelligence is not just with each other, but also with groups outside. Also with groups outside. The last point that I would like to make about this is you have to comply with the law. You have to comply with the law of the land, inshallah. Compliance with the law of the land is what makes things easy for you. So if, the, if you're going to do certain things, try and make sure that if it's a question of being registered as a group or being registered as a trust or as a society or as a whatever it is, make sure that you have your registration documents intact. Make sure that if, if there's anything that might, that might stand in your way that from a legal perspective, it asumbua, hakikisha mume, sort your mambo. Because you also don't want to find yourselves in a position where things are starting to, to go wrong, especially when it comes to collection of, of, of money and funds. Try and pay attention to 
the law of the land, the law of that area, whether it's county laws or whatever it is. A lot of these points can be removed and expanded and we can speak point by point, but I want to stop there, inshallah, because it's, it's a bit heavy. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all your efforts and increase the ni'mah and the khair in all your activities, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.